thought if I could find a great three chord rock and roll band, that I could probably make a gazillion dollars. Val Cooper, he heard there was a southern scene going on down here with Almond Brothers and other groups. When I first saw them play at Finocchio's, the song that really got me was Freebird. If I leave here tomorrow. I just saw every young kid in America hearing that song and putting their head down like that and running right into the wall. I realized that that was the band that I was looking for. The interesting thing was that uh, Capricorn Records, which was the only alternative for a southern band at the time, was owned by Phil Walden. And his younger brother, Alan Walden, was managing this band. Alan wanted Leonard Skinner on Capricorn, but it wasn't going to happen. And we continued our career, not really making it, but just still starving, paying dues and stuff. I started thinking maybe I should start a record label as an alternative to Capricorn. I went to MCA, so we made a deal for my label, which was called Sounds of the South. Ronnie Van Zant called me up. Somebody broke into our van last night and stole all our equipment. And I'm asking you for a loan of $5,000. So I said, just tell me where to mail the check. He said, let me tell you something. He says, you just bought yourself a band for $5,000. They basically met at a baseball field when they were about 13 or 14 years old. It was Alan and Gary on guitars, and uh, Leon on bass, Bob Burns on drums, and Ronnie on lead vocals. I went to this game to see Ronnie. He had a badass reputation around town. We grew up on the west side of Jacksonville, and, and we called it Shanty Town. Ronnie hit a foul ball, and bam, it hit Bob. Ronnie came over to apologize. We got to talk, and that's when we realized Ronnie Hip was in a, a band. Please take my car away. I had a guitar, played a little bit, and Bob had some drums. We needed another guitar player. And back then, it was whoever had an amp and guitar was fine. So Bob and I knew this guy named Alan Collins, and we saw him, and we, we screamed out of the car, hey, Alan, Alan, stop, we want to talk to you. And he saw Ronnie and thought, Oh my God, this guy's gonna beat me up. Climbed up a tree so we, we couldn't get him. I said, no, we're not gonna hurt you. Come down, we want you to play. I can remember them rehearsing in my mother and father's living room. And at that particular time, they were called a 1%. Ryan, myself, and Alan, we just knew one day, and in our hearts and our minds, we wanted to make it really big as a band, and that was our dream. Two, two. When we formed Muscle Sound Studios, Alan came up 
and he wanted to present Skinner to us. When Leonard Skinner first came here, they were just like high school kids. I totally fell in love with Ronnie Van Sant's fantastic voice. Alan Collins and Gary Rossington, they were doing solos that were twins. We signed them just because I fell in love with, the, with those, those three guys. They kind of taught us, and they were like our, they adopted us, so to speak. They took us in. They didn't have any money. They didn't have uh, anything but enthusiasm and, and, and quite a bit of talent. And they taught us how to record. We'd never been in a studio, so we didn't really know anything about it. They didn't have fistfights. I mean, actually, fistfights. You're supposed to go to a G chord instead of an A chord. That's how they settled their disagreements, so they just fought. Wound up producing 17 songs on them. That's where we recorded our very first album. We had nine minute songs like Freebird. And one thing I would not do is edit them. He went out to LA to play it for all these uh, record executives, Capitol and MCA. And so I got turned down by every label in the industry. And it hurt because the stuff was fantastic. And we were all disappointed freaked out and, and going through we thought well we just don't know what we're doing because that's the best songs we can write right now you know i was ready for the band and they they all went you play piano King joined the band the same day I did. He took over Leon Wilkinson's place. I happened to meet them on a tour when I was in this band, The Strawberry Alarm Clock. And Ronnie called me up and said, our bass player quit. We'd like you to join the band as a bass player. Ronnie Van Zandt would pick us up for rehearsal every morning, like between 7 and 8 o'clock, and we'd get out to Hell House, you know around 8 30 or so it was just a one room little shack and the sun in florida would hit it and it was hot as hell well, the first thing we did was take our shirts off there was something about those kind of conditions that made us crack the whip we would rehearse day after day hour after hour and just tried really hard and we were writing a lot of tunes just the ideas would flow being out there in the middle of the boondocks and the unity at the Hell House was probably the tightest that, that it ever has been since I've been in the band. Ronnie said, why don't you come outside for a minute? Ronnie was a very persuasive gentleman. We can guarantee you this will get no airplay, but y'all just go ahead, you stubborn kids. three quarters of an album uh, in uh, Muscle Shoals. We had these songs that we'd done on that other album. And um, so we played most of those and we recorded them again. It took us two weeks to record the album. They knew these songs very well. Now there's this one song you got on there called Freebird. It's too long. Y'all can't do that one. And we went, hey man, we're gonna do that song. That's we love this song. Well, we can guarantee you this will get no airplay, but y'all just go ahead, you stub stubborn kids. We needed one more song for the first Skinner record, so we went up and recorded Simple Man. Cooper said, you guys aren't going to record that. Don't like it. So uh, Ronnie said, why don't you come outside for a minute? So Cooper and him walked outside. He opened up the door to Al's Bentley and said, get in. And Al got in, and Ronnie shut the door and stuck his head into the window, and he goes, well, we're done cutting it, we'll call you. Kind of 
have to say they, they would pretty much get their way. Ronnie was a very persuasive gentleman. The reason it was called pronounced was because people would see the name and they didn't know how to pronounce that. With all the Y's, it didn't look like Leonard Skinner. It just looked like... Leinard Skynard. I went to them and I begged them to change their name. And of course they wouldn't do that. Pronounced didn't really do real good. It, it just kind of opened some eyes and ears. Well, we put out a couple of singles and we couldn't get anywhere with them. So Freebird turned out to be the really big cut, started getting a lot of airplay on FM radio. And at the same time, I bumped into Pete Townsend from The Who. So I said, hey, Pete, what are you doing? He said, uh, oh, we're getting out on tour soon with, with this uh, new album, Quadrophenia. He said, we're actually looking for an opening act. I said, have I got the band for you? Tour. Our first gig was the Cow Palace in San Francisco with Bill Graham and uh, The Who, and there was 22,000 people there. Here's these guys that were playing, you know, like 500-seat bars, and now all of a sudden they're playing 20 and 30,000 seaters every night. And that's when we started drinking. You go play it in front of 300 people to 22,000 and drive you to drinking, you know? They picked up a lot of the bad habits from him. Ronnie would come in and he'd have a Jack Daniels bottle and he'd just empty it in the back of the TV, would blow up, catch on fire, and now the window would go into the swimming pool. <laughs> One day at rehearsal, Ronnie goes, man, you're really the worst bass player I've ever played with. He said, we're going to get Leon back in the band, and we're going to switch you over to guitar. Then the next day, we start up rehearsals again. You know, I mean, 8 o'clock in the morning, out to Hell House. And the first song we wrote that day was Sweet Home Alabama. At the time, George Wallace was running for president, and he was the governor of Alabama. He was, like, really bad racist, and we were trying to cut him down, but Ronnie liked his attitude, but not about race, but about other things. He stood the ground for the Southern man. Well, I heard Mr. Young sing about him. Well, I heard old Neil. The song Alabama, it was cutting down Southern man. Well, I hope Neil Young He's from Canada anyway. What's he know about it? And I guess if you're from another culture like the North, you could look at that and say, boy, those people are really stupid or ignorant. To me, the South has a, uh, a charm and a culture like no other in the entire world. It just recorded with Muscle Shoals, Swampers, all in Alabama. And we've been driving all around the backcountry, seeing how beautiful it was and meeting all these great people. They called me right after they did it and said, anyway, we just wrote a song about you guys. And I was going, oh, that's nice. When Second Help came out, uh, people really caught on to Sweet Home Alabama. So we kind of knew, wow, this three guitar thing is going to really work well. And then they started buying the first album. And when those two caught on, that was when it was really like the overnight success story. We were on the road so long, we called it the torture tour, actually. Bob Burns had a tough time on the road. Bob kind of had some mental problems and went mentally unstable, so I say. And they got a new drummer, Artemis Pyle. Saturday Night Special uh, it was the first time that Artemis played drums with the band. And I'm trying to show the band this this thing I'm working on is da 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 And Ronnie's over in the corner going, keep playing it, keep playing it. And he sings to me, two feet they come up creeping like a black cat do. And 
I just went, whoa, this stuff. First album um, after Nothing Fancy we did was Give Me Back My Bullets. We went back to the original two guitars that Ed King had left the band. written about the music industry. It's about the bullets on the charts. Sweet talking to people done ran me out of town. And I drank another whiskey, throw a bottle, slip around. And I'm leaving this game one step ahead of you. And you will not hear me cry, cause I do not seem to do After Give Me Back My Bullets didn't go gold, we decided we need to go and get three guitar players out. Cassie was our backup singer at the time, so Cassie suggested, um, hey, you want to you know, take a listen to my brother? And this one we got Steve Gaines. At that time, actually, we also had just quit drinking. I'd just gotten a wreck in my car. So that's what happens if you keep messing with stuff like that. We went and uh, did Street Survivors. It was going to be their greatest album. And we thought it was like a brand spanking new beginning. South Carolina on our way to Baton Rouge. Something happened in the flight where it was uh, leaking gas. We were playing poker and smoking and walking around. Nobody was buckled. Looking at the wind. Co pilot came back and said, Guys, we have a problem. The trees are getting closer. It's we were kind of afraid because it was old beat up Sherman tank like thing. You, you guys sit down and buckle up and put your head between your legs. There was no gas, so we were just floating, you know. We heard the thumping and that was hitting the tops of the trees. You know, it was going bam, 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 bam. bam. Thing that does not buckle or lock down comes forward like a bullet. 
So this tape players and TVs and cards and guitar cases and suit, everything came forth. We were in the swamps and there was a plane on fire and you were hearing all your buddies and best friends screaming and crying. yelling for Dean, he came over and threw that door off of me. And it's a fact that Dean Kilpatrick was killed at impact. These people heard the crash and um, Artemis went up this hill and he found this guy that shot over his head with a shotgun thinking he was some kind of damn swamp monster or something. They got all their people to come out there with their sheets and blankets and everything and plucked us out of two feet of swamp muck. to hit Ronnie in his head and it broke his neck. I knew that Ronnie was gone and I knew that Steve was gone because I knew where they were sitting. And I wasn't sure about Cassie until I saw her later. Me and Ronnie and Alan and Dean and Cassie were all up front, all together. And they all died and Alan and I didn't up there. And we always wondered why we were not, uh, you know, God, it just wasn't our time. Ronnie, Steve, Cassie and Dean would want us to carry this music on. I thought that Ronnie had been killed and sat down and wrote this thing. And it was the way I viewed my relationship with Ronnie and that we had spent late nights together and that we had traveled miles together that uh, we were friends. It was a sad day for not only Southern Rock but for the Van Zandt family. When I was young And record labels were going, well, the Southern Rock movement's dead and da-da-da-da. And, uh... You know what, 10 years after the plane crashed, Leonard Skinner got back together and it seemed like it started coming back again. And then I think we're God blessed that people still want to hear us. As long as that lasts, we'll be here. I think it's actually ventured into the country market. You know, you got Montgomery Gentry, you got Gretchen Wilson, you got Big and Rich. Southern rock influenced country as it is today more than it ever has. And I tell you what, the country players, they don't mind telling you. Uh, those songs will be played on the radio and somebody will be digging it uh, when we're long gone. <laughs>